Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It is Good Friday, April 7th, 2023. My name is Matt, this is Crypto Heartbeat, and this is The Pulse, and this is the fourth episode with Steve Staggs. And if you've been following this, this is like mind-numbing stuff. You know, I've, I've mentioned to you in previous discussions that I um, I came to know the Lord. I had this experience of what the truth was on September 10th of 2000. Literally, my life changed like a thousand pounds was lifted off my back. And of course, I've been on this journey for the last 23 years of going, how, what's this all about? And so if it wasn't for the Texan token and Hex, I wouldn't have met Steve Staggs. And it's amazing how just God weaves these things together and goes, hey, you're going to invite a guy who's really not in the community to come and he's going to bring a friend. And that friend is going to like shake your hand and the Lord is going to say, listen to this guy. And I was like, Lord, is he an angel? This is what I said. I literally said that, which is so funny. But I think what's really cool about this is um, that there are people in this world like Steve Staggs who God has called to um, to write, to encourage, to ask incredibly great questions, but also to challenge. And, and there's this, this concept of sharpening, right? Iron sharpening iron. And there's this really interesting thing about community that we talk about all the time on this channel of how um, we, we encourage one another. And it's really, uh, it's a, it's like this, um, it's love is what it is, right? It's care, it's concern. It's also, um, it's joy because it is, um, it's, there's so many pictures of this in the scriptures, right? And I think that um, Paul and Timothy, I think about all these kind of mentor, mentee, but also friendship relationships that, that help, you know, move you forward. And I think what's really cool is that we're in this world and it's clear to me that God wants to use us in each other's lives. And that's what this whole series is about is Steve and I have been having these things and I'm like, Steve, this stuff is so good. And we got to like share this with other people because you're blowing my mind. And of course, he's like, don't listen to me, dude. Don't listen to me. Ask him yourself. And of course, as I ask him myself, like, you know, literally mind numbing epiphanies come. And I'm going to share one with you today because it's really cool. But I'm just so thankful that we're in Holy Week and that this is a time where we stop and we say, it's Good Friday, and what does that Good Friday mean? Let's welcome back to the polls, Steve Staggs, for episode four on Good Friday. And it's also Master's Week, which is pretty cool. Steve, what's going on? Hey, guys. Howdy, howdy, sir. Hello there. How are you this Good Friday morning? I'm doing good on this Good Friday morning. Thank you. How about you guys? <laughs> we got a lot of folks in the chat here. Let's say hello to a couple of them before we jump in. Sam Kemp, episode four, more wisdom forthcoming. That's right. <laughs> Texas, life, thanks so much for the peace and the prayers. Michael Ostell, must not be late, <laughs> must not be late. That's right, Michael. Thanks for being here. Uh, blessed Good Friday to all. David Lee, all the way from southwestern Indiana, continuing to share the love. He's about as consistent as they come. The guy who came to my dad's funeral and sat with me and bared my burdens, and I appreciate that so much. Ari from the Philippines is here. It's a late night for you, Ari. I think you're in the Philippines, but I appreciate uh, what you all are doing there. DJ and Dougie Peach is here. Uh, Kadium, hello. Hello to you. Um, fantastic. Ego Foundation, good to see you. Crypto Bo Bigfoot. It's like all the usual suspects are back for you, Steve. Uh, Rich Liberations here. Crypto Pez, great day to do this broadcast. God bless you and the family. Love is a verb, not a noun. There you go. Caliente, hey, from Chicago, ready for some alpha. There you go. This is some Jesus alpha today. Um, David Lee's excited to see Steve and David Lee with the love. So, Steve, let me start with this. You know, I want to understand kind of your perspective and how you look at, you know, we're commemorating something that is... A, a picture which tells a story, right? And so Good Friday, you probably, you know, people probably hear it, whether they've been in the church or not, or, not, you know, this is an event and it's a, we're recalling an event and reminding ourselves of an event. What does it mean and how should we see Good Friday in your opinion? Um, well, I'm a guy that the 
that Jesus is taught to um, look for the story behind the story. So anyone who's been in the church for very long or been a part of a, the Christian community, you know, has at least some understanding or concept of, you know, Passion Week and uh, Good Friday and things of that nature. Um, but I know in my past experience, I was only given just a snippet. Yeah. And that snippet really caused me to kind of get focused on the cruelty and injustice of Jesus being crucified and the um, the horrific character that was on display through the people, through Pilate, through Herod, through the Sanhedrin, you know, all of these vile, vile human beings doing this vile thing. And so Good Friday was really a commemoration of that horrible event that was the ultimate expression of God's love and grace because Jesus was dying on the cross for my sins and through that process was redeeming me back to himself. So in the midst of this horrific event, there was this wonderful expression of God's love toward me. Huh. All good. But that is only a very minute piece of what was going on 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 that Friday. And it's, whereas the previous way that I looked at things got me to focusing on that bittersweet event 2,000 years ago, when he took me into the story behind the story, guess what that did? That launched me into an eternal element that was constantly causing me and empowering me and inspiring me to look forward. Huh. That no, what happened on that day was much bigger than what you think happened, Steve. And because of that, you really don't have an appreciation for what, for what was occurring there. Not to mention, that what you've been told was happening isn't what was happening at all. And so when I, you know, when you asked me the other day about Good Friday and about Good Friday here, this was the day when, when Jesus fulfilled the Father's vision, which was the foundation for everything that was created and everything that has transpired from then till now and what will yet transpire. Jesus fulfilled that establishing the Father as the sole divine. That he that every challenge to to his to him being the supreme sovereign was settled that day. Now the way that it was settled was that Jesus used every lever and maneuver that uh, I'm just going to say his name, Satan was using to try to put Jesus in his control. Jesus used that to actually get Satan into Jesus's control. And when he did that, he stripped him of the, of the spiritual authority he had, which was death, and he brought that back into and under the reign of God under his kingdom to serve his purposes, not the purposes established and operating under the rule of Satan. Well, we got to pause right there, man. Wow. Folks, if you're not like catching what Steve is throwing down, like this is amazing. So I, I just want to pause there and and. For those of you who may or may not know, what's incredible about what led up to this point, you know, I kind of back out to, we've started a lot of times in the garden 
And the thing I think that I've, I've gathered from all this, that's been a breakthrough for me after 23 years is this idea of authority, right? You talked about naming rights last week, you talked about authority, but you also made it very clear that at this moment when the serpent says and lies to Eve and they give their authority. And I think this is one of the biggest things that I never really heard in the church was this idea that this was a transaction in which you gave up your authority. And so amazingly, think about this, folks. This happened along, you know, we think in terms of time. But God knowing this, and I think the thing that really, you know, you talk about the story behind the story a lot is like, let's dig into this and really understand this. Like when we first talked, you said, do you think it was a surprise to God that the serpent was there? Do you think it was a surprise? Like there were flaming swords out there. How did he get in? How did Satan overtake and, and come into this crafty, intelligent one who was speaking to Eve? But what's interesting about it is if you imagine that this was the plan all along, right? Because I think we we often are so restricted by linear time that when we see, hold on, this is part of this plan. Well, I fo fast forward to this moment, right? So here we are, Good Friday, right? Jesus goes to the cross. He's crucified. He's going to die today. And what is the, the meaning of this? That think of the, the what I constantly think about is I'm imagining Moses on the mountain. And it's like, here you go. Here, here are these rules, right? This beginning of these rules. And then here's this box. Put this stuff in this box and then build this tabernacle. And here's this analog for what this relationship is like. And you can enter into this, but only once a year. And there are all these rules around how in which how we atone for this separation that's between us that that literally, you know. But what's amazing about it, it's like I always felt like my dad would always warn me. Be like, if you boys don't stop that, I'm going to stop this car. Right. And I'm like, he's warning you and warning you, warning. We keep going. We're idiots. My dad slams on the brakes. And of course, that was like a 1978 Chevy van with no seatbelts. And you literally went flying forward. And my dad, he looked like Wolfman. Man, he had a big old beard. And he just literally knocked our heads together. And we just kind of looked up and we we're like, man, dad's pretty serious here. And it feels a lot like that. It's like, hold on a second. I had a plan all along. But to think that this plan is this you know, it's amazing that, that someone, that God himself would sacrifice himself in order to right this wrong. And it's such a justice thing, but it also has like very specific requirements to it. But I love this idea because what you're saying, which I've never really heard in all this, is that authority was given away. It's not just like, well, you ate from this thing and well, now you're dirty. No, 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 no. Hold on. This is a whole thing of authority. My intent is that you are listening to me and that we are building this kingdom together in your authority. And you said to me early on, you're like, we've forgotten who we are. Yeah. And so when you start sharing these things about authority and understanding, hold on a second, this moment that Jesus is literally, you know, he says, it is finished. Can you speak about that? Because I'm just so like in love with that story because it's so profound. Well, yeah, the, um, I'm, I don't know if something got in the way there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read something that we read, when we read the, um, the Bible, we we insert into that a presumption that it is true. Now, there's a lot that goes into how that happens, but one of the ways that it happens is because we declare it to be true. Mm. Okay, now, now this might get a little bit hairy, but the, you know, within the Christian community, and you've even talked about it yourself on the on the channel about these idols. Yeah. Well, what is, what is an idol? Well, in the simplest form, an idol is something that we have made and decreed that it is God. And then it's signed to it, the attributes it's supposed to exercise on our behalf. Yeah. And then we bow down to it. 
Okay, now unpack that one for a minute. Yeah. Okay. So we actually require the thing that we have made to be able to do more than what we ourselves, the makers, can do. Yeah. All the time. And then we bow down to it. Mm -hmm. And we, now what that is, that is an example of naming rights being exercised through our behavior that then puts us in a subordinate position to the very thing we've made. Wow. And the thing we have made has no more power than what we ourselves have because we're the ones who made it. Yeah. Well, now, the golden they, calf, that golden calf is like blaring in this story. I mean, and what's amazing is it happens at the time when Moses is actually up on the mountain that they actually would literally build this thing and worship a golden calf. Anyway, sorry. It's just amazing. Well, and after they had experienced all of these yeah. once in a, um, like in an age kind of experience. I mean, they, they yeah. observed all this stuff that Jehovah had done, you know, with and through Moses against, you know, uh, Pharaoh and Egypt, they saw all of that. Right. Okay. So why, why am I bringing that up? Because when we look at the Bible, we call it the word of God. Right. It doesn't call itself the word of God. Right. Right. It's a huge it's, distinction. That, that is what it calls itself. Yeah. It doesn't even make the slightest reference to that. What, but you say, okay, so what is it that makes it the word of God? When we say it's the word of God, what does that actually mean? Well, God cannot be dis separated from his word. So this written page has now become equivalent to, to God. But wait a minute. God didn't say that about the written page. Right. He didn't say anything about that. We said that. Okay. And that's been confusing to me for a long time because I came to know the Lord and really engage in this at 28 years old. And I would be honest with you, you know, like having to learn the Christianese within the church, it's almost like you had to accept that. And when you said this, you know, I talk about the, the technology, the printing press, and I've all, often wondered about this, you know, what were things like before Jesus came on the scene? And now what I've recognized is that Jesus has always been speaking, yeah. always, because he Not was there at the beginning. And people were talking to him. Yeah. And there are illustrations of this. But it's interesting. It's almost like we, we got a new technology, which is man's creation of the printing press, which definitely disseminated this tool. Absolutely. People had this tool and it is powerful. But what's really amazing about it is I've never really honestly talked to anyone who had the cojones to call it out for what it really is. It's a book and it yeah. is different book in your hands than a different book in my hands. But the word of God is the spoken word. I think that's where you're going. Well, I am. And the, and these are all really important um, concepts, Matt, because we, there are people all around this world, whether they have ever, ever heard the name of Jesus within them, there is this crystal clarity of a supreme being that they find themselves not only searching for, but being de completely devoted to. It's just in their makeup. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if you were the enemy of those people and you wanted to control them, how would you do that? Well, we talked about a couple of weeks ago about, about, you know, Solomon says, as a man thinks, so is he. Mm. So you would start attacking the way he or she thinks about things. If you can shape the way they think, if you can control the way they think, then you can start being able to control their belief system, which controls their, acti you know, their behavior. Well, gosh, I just described what's happening today yeah. all around us. Hearts Why and this kind of stuff is going on. See? It, and, it's, and it's blatant. Well, guess what? There's a lot of blatant stuff around us if we'll just step outside of it and look at it. 
And so don't want to go too much deeper into, into the whole Bible picture. But here's what then begins to happen. We are then told, because it is the word of God, that what we're supposed to do is to submit, submit our life to the authority of the Bible. Well, would somebody please tell me where the Bible requires that of me? Yeah. You know, we talked about before. Well, I, I think I think the thing that is recorded that this Bible records is the father saying, no, this is my son. Listen to him. Amen. See, he, he's the guy you need to listen to. See, he has no equivalent. Well, and he Moses, could have said. The law, yeah. Moses, the law, and Elijah, the prophets, law and the prophets, their scriptures, they're not equivalent to my son. All right. See, they're not equivalent at all. He's the one I'm saying for you to listen to. Well, when he says in, in the Bible, it says it is finished and it leaves it there. Well, you know, the first question that comes to me is, well, Jesus, what exactly was finished? Yeah. If you finished it, what did you finish? And when did you start it? Yeah. And what was the conflict? Yeah. What was left undone? You know, what, what the heck was that all about? You know, I'm glad it was finished. Now, geez, but what was finished? Could you bring, bring me into the play here a little bit? Yeah. You know, I'd like to know what the heck was going on because we're all calling this a sacrifice and I'm learning more and more. This wasn't a sacrifice at all. This was a highly strategic, very sophisticated tactic being, being played out where Jesus brought everybody into what he was doing and where he was going and made sure there was no deviation from that plan. Wow. Why? Because he needed to go into the spiritual domain as a man under the command of his father to accomplish the mission that was prescribed before time began, which was that God's man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Now, his man up to that point in time ruled the physical earthly realm, but that wasn't the vision, the vision that he would rule the creation, which had a spiritual element to it. So his man had to go in and deal with the, with the rebel that was there to bring that under the subject, subject that under the authority of the kingdom of God. Wow. Well, I think that's a lot bigger than just redemption. Yeah. At least in my thinking, that's like, whoa, what's going on? So here's what the definitions of the words of the verse you just spoke about when Jesus said it is finished. It is finished. The necessary process has been completed to reach the end aim and the debt is discharged, making way for the next phase. Yeah. Well, if I can if I can look at the definitions and come up with that, then why didn't the Bible translators come up with that? Because though what I just described are the definitions of the words of that verse, not the English words, the original words as we have them. Well, guys, why didn't you tell me that? That says a whole lot more to me than just it is finished. Man. The necessary process has been completed to reach the end aim. Jesus, what is that? That our father's man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. It is finished. That has been accomplished. And now what it does it resolves the debt. The debt is discharged. Well, what is the debt you're talking about? Well, now we're back to the Good Friday conversation. Yep. You remember, and John records this, you remember where, where Pilate was trying to release Jesus and saying, guys, dudes, this guy hadn't done anything, man. What, what, yeah. what are you up to? And Pilate's wife was kept saying, hey, don't kill this guy. Right. I have a really bad feeling about this. And all you husbands out there know what happens when your wife has a really bad feeling about it. Amen to that. It's like, okay, 
I'm learning to listen. Okay, what do you what do you say, dear? What's up with you? <laughs> yeah. But Pilate was put in and was put in a bad situation. Um. And so here, all of this stuff is going is going on where Pilate is trying to release him. Even Herod is trying to release him. You know, and um, so finally, everybody is prevailing and. Pilate comes to, to Jesus and says, look at man, what's going on with you? I'm trying to set you free. And I'm going to use a little bit of the common vernacular. Yeah. But um, he says, man, I'm trying to set you free. And these people out here are calling for your head. And one of the things they're calling for is they're saying in our law, um, we have it that if one makes themselves out to be a God or the son of God, that, that, in, that they incur a debt that can only be discharged through their death. Huh. Okay. Oh, so Pilate, we have a law and we need you to help us enforce the law. And this guy has made himself out, himself out to be the son of God. And because he's made himself out to be the son of God, we are declaring that he has made himself to be God. And therefore, he has incurred a debt, the obligation of which can only be repaid through his death. We are calling for the question. Jesus, what do you say about that, man? I'm trying to help you out here. Don't you know that I have the authority to crucify you or, not, or I have the authority to set you free? And Jesus looks at him and says, you would have no authority over me if it were not first given to you from above. But as a result, the one who has delivered me to you will suffer the greatest loss and experience the greatest forfeiture. Well, who delivered Jesus to Pilate and everybody else? Okay. It was the devil who entered into Judas to begin the process that Jesus likewise said, hey, by the way, I'm ahead of the curve. I see this dude falling from heaven like lightning. He does not know that he is about to forfeit everything he thinks he has and owns and possesses but he's the one who's going to have the greatest loss. So now here's the story behind the story. Pilate, you would have no authority over me if it were not first given to you from above. I call these the dot, dot, dots, huh. but dot, dot, dot. Oh, by the way, Satan, I would rethink what you're about to do here. If my father has just delivered me over to the authority of your henchmen, I would give that some serious thought. Because what's about to happen is you're about to give it all back. You're about to forfeit it all. I'm about to take it from you. Now, how do we know that that was part of the exchange? Well, there's this little statement that Paul makes, it says, if the rulers of this age would have understand this wisdom that was at work, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because they lost it all. While thinking they were wise, they became foolish. They did not see the trap that was being set for them. The son of man entered into the domain of darkness under the direct command and authority of his father. And when he did, he took it all back. And he came back. Now, what did it say that happened there? Well, he set the captives free. Where well, what is the one of the big things that you and all the folks of, you know, in crypto are wanting to do? Yeah. Set the captives free. Well, teach them how to be free. Okay. Teach them how to be free. Okay. If the sun shall make you free, guess what? 
you will be free indeed. Okay? So, to me, this is just not, you know, our Friday sessions are just not about talking about spiritual things, um, as great as they are. But it's really about in the kingdom, there is no separation between material and spiritual, the earthly and material. They're all part of the same plan. They're all part of the same game. Have you ever heard, I've heard this before, it says you're awake in the dark and asleep in the light. Yeah. It seems like that speaks to this idea that you, you mentioned that we have knit into us this knowledge and understanding, right? That there's that there's this one who has created it all, right? And we're seeking this out. And it's interesting how all of the things we try to utilize to potentially be a replacement for that. And then when we come, you know, for me, I was at the end of myself, right? And I just literally, it's like, my life was unmanageable and I literally came face to face with him. Yeah. And it's like, well, this is, this is, a, this is the, this is where everything leads. And it's amazing. The more and more you dig into the story, the more and more you realize it in a way it, it, it's like the Escher painting where you're, you're walking on the steps and you end up where you started. Mm. It's, this, it's this infinite loop. And what's really amazing about that infinite loop is that it keeps bringing you back to Jesus himself because you have to like deal with this thing. And I think what's amazing about it is it's not just an event. It's not just an event. It's actually the beginning of something new. And that's the thing that is so exciting. You know, here we are on Friday and of course on, you know, everyone's like, he's risen, right? And this, but what's so amazing to, and I just want to put an exclamation point because this has been my experience and even to this day, I mean, last week at church, Jesus is presented as a historical figure, and they defend the fact that he was a real man and all this stuff. But it's like they're in this trap of the world that's saying, hold on, you're, you're putting him in a safe distance behind you, and that you're putting the Bible up front. Okay, And this is what's happened at my church, and I love these folks, right? But I, I'm seeing this so clearly. It's that, hold on a second. You know, some of the songs we sing, speak to exactly what you're talking about. And then, but what I hear in general is we've got this reverence for this historical Jesus, but we do not have this appreciation for the living Jesus. And it's interesting that you talk about an idol that's been put before us because you know, it's, you know, people have said in, in the scripture talks about the, the word of God being like a sword and I think what's really interesting about this, swords have two edges to them. Yeah. And what's funny about, not funny, but interesting about this concept of the word of God, right? Because words are spoken and it talks about faith coming through hearing and this idea that, you know, listen to him. And as you boil it down, I think, you know, if it was about knowledge and it was about accumulating information, then children would not be able to engage with it. Yeah. But what's so beautiful about it is that actually the like children have an advantage. Yeah. And I think what's so cool about this infinite loop is that you keep, you see how deep and how, how strategic and you see how complex, but then it comes right back around and says, it's so simple. Yeah. And it's like a constant, you know, infinite loop of, you know, the more and more I realize there's no, there's no bottom to the depths of this. But it all comes back to the surface, which is like, yeah, it's simple too. And I feel like it's byproduct. That's the thing that, that I love about it as well, is that it's not without incentive, you know, but it's not the incentive that you think it is. And that's the big epiphany that I had today or last night. And I got so excited about telling you about it was this, this idea that, hold on a second, this is, this is real true application when you recognize that it's not just a historical event, but this is actually something that um, is our opportunity to join and move forward with him because he's alive and he speaks. And I feel like, folks, for those of you, the reason that I we're even doing this is because Steve's invested so much time to really ask me some difficult questions like, hey, you know, this world is upside down. The whole theme of this is right side up. What does it mean to be have right side up? Well, you have to start seeing things in a way that 
and, and I'd love for you to speak about this because this is this fits so well with this story is it seems like coming and understanding that hold on this is there's two sides of this coin there's the physical and the spiritual and they're meant to be one yeah. and the more and more you listen to him the more and more you realize hold on a second they're becoming one and that there's this idea of ruling with him and it merging and yeah. this kingdom this merger of these things but what's interesting about it is there's a lot of noise there's a lot of noise in this physical world that is blaring in our ears and he's saying no no i'm here and i'm speaking but why would i be speaking like why why would i even be here to speak to you if i did not have a plan for you and so i use the fun the funny term for me is like the gaming code you know like I, my son's 11 you know he plays games a lot he's like dad we need to get the cheat codes man we need the cheat codes for the game i'm like well that's not how the game was meant to be played He's like, but yeah, we need these cheat codes. I can be like super tall and dunk on everybody in this game. And what hit me last night was, you know, it's amazing how Jesus isn't hiding the ball. And it's really interesting is that all things are pointing to him. But it's like, hold on, we've, there's so many idols that have been put in front of us. Like when Lambo. When? When am I going to have my Lambo? Because what? And if I have my Lambo, what's that mean? People look at me and think I'm somebody. It, it's really about social signaling to say, I am somebody now because I have something that the world has said is valuable. And it's amazing in this finished work that washes completely away. And now I understand what Paul said. I can have contentment in any and every situation. And, and that's the incentive that I, I constantly talk about is like, here we're talking about the money and you go, hold on a second. No, no, no. It's the story of every great story. A man wants something, a Lambo, right? It's like he goes and he works hard to try to find this thing. But in the process, it points him back to the true, the truth. Yeah. And that truth is actually where life and incentive is, is the thing that you're desiring, that you're chasing after, that you can never grasp a hold of because the world in its physical self, in, in that side of the coin, does not provide, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't even out the equation. No. It's not capable. And so when you encounter this, it's amazing that Jesus himself, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It is absolutely amazing. Sorry, those, those I, I don't know how to turn them off. I'm figuring it out. <laughs> oh, Steve, this is so, it's so rich. It's so rich, you know, like eating one of those chocolate cakes that you're like, I can only eat like a bite because this is so rich and dense. Well, I think that the thing that I like to pass on to folks is that if you want to know how the creation works, don't go to the book, go to the author of the book. I mean, it's, I love the scriptures. I enjoy them. But I'll tell you what, I, there was a time where you could hardly point to a, a story, a verse, a scripture, a, a concept where I couldn't tell you exactly where it was and, and what it was about. Yeah. And according to most folks, I was a well-studied, well-versed among the elite when it came to knowing what those scriptures said, what the Bible said. And let me tell you what, I didn't know anything compared to what Jesus, you know, un unlocks to you, because the very design of the Bible is to restrict your, you know, your becoming aware of who God is while telling you and promising you that it's going to take you to where God is. You mentioned the verse in, you know, that Paul was speaking to Timothy about always learning 
but never coming to a knowledge, the knowledge of what is true. Mm. I had all the knowledge. I just hadn't, didn't have a clue about what was true about that knowledge. In the, the, the term a form of godliness, but denying its power. Yeah, because that's what it does. It, that word deny means to, to deny, reject, cut, the, cut off the source of the knowledge of what is true. So that's exactly what happens. So we're giving, a, we're being given a counterfeit, a just a smidgen of what's there. So that so, is carrying that is carrying tremendous promise, but not delivering anything of real substance when it comes time to actually being engaged with what Jesus is doing at this time. You know, in our time. Mm -hmm. You know, in the unfolding of the, of the plan. Well, that's what I was interested in. Yeah. You know, I came out of a baseball background where, you know, yeah, I wanted to practice a whole lot, but I wanted to get in the game too. I wasn't satisfied with just practicing a whole lot. I wanted to get in the game. That was my makeup. Well, the way I was being taught didn't, didn't allow for that. Yeah. It allowed me only to get to the form of it never allowed me to get to the substance of it. So that's what I'm, you know, my basic hope is, is uh, folks out there will listen and say, man, I want to do that. Yeah. Oh, I want to try. Jesus says, Hey, ask me and I'll tell you, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Let me try to do that. And my encouragement is just venture into the game, just play the game let him take you where he wants to take you. The day will come. You'll be glad you did it. Yeah. You'll never look back with regret. Well, and it, there's so many things wrapped up in all of that, that just my mind is, is thinking about and is a summary of some of the stuff that you're causing me to think about is that, you know, I think prior to the printing press, prior to having the book, Obviously, there were scrolls, right? And there were handwritten replicas of, you know, different, you know, the Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible, there was, you know, scribes that were writing these things out. And they were obviously trying to do the best that they could to, to make duplicated copies because they didn't have the technology. But what's interesting about it is there's so many, you know, in the Proverbs talking about how to raise a child. There's conversations about, hey, what should you do? Well, let's remember this, right? Jesus said the Sabbath is for man, these constant reminders. Well, why do we do this? Well, we're doing this to remind ourselves. And it even says to, to dads, it says, hey, when you get up, when you walk on the road, and when you eat and when you lay down, that you're, you're constantly sharing these stories. Well, so many of these stories prior to the printing press were spoken reminders, right? These were spoken reminders of stories. And of course, you think about, you know, Jesus comes in this triumphant em entry, and what does he do? What's, what's Tuesday, Wednesday? It's like teaching. And of course, people sat there and they're like, well, we get this guy, what is this guy doing? And they're just hanging on his every word. And I think about this, why? Because he's speaking. And of course, there were reading, amazing, he literally drops the, the mic and reads, you know, I'm here. But to think that, you know, even the Reformation of the Church, this idea that, hold on a second, this isn't, what you're doing and what this says isn't the same thing. And I constantly come back to this idea of derivatives, right? We create derivatives in, in finance all the time, right? Like um, Hedron, for those that are in this uh, hex world, Hedron's a derivative of hex. It's dependent upon hex, and it reflects hex. Well, if you think about this, you, what you said is so true and it's so big is who is the author? Who wrote it? Well, it's a depiction or a derivative in capturing and storing up, even, you know, like Mary storing these things up in her heart. Like an angel spoke to me. I'm so happy. Right. And it's like, oh, no, I'm going to save these things up. But think about what we do, Steve. I don't write out and say, look, my story about a thousand pounds lifted off my back is the scriptures. No, but you understand what happened. 
And you're like, praise the Lord. What a wonderful thing that he spoke to you and had you turn around and talk to that woman. Or how amazing was it that, yeah, you had this physical experience of weight lifted off of you. And I tell you these stories and I'm like, I can't stop talking about this because it gives me such deep peace and there's real value in it. And it's like irresistible, right? It's And, and you go, and it's obviously been, clear to me that this is this is the real stuff not the derivative stuff and so i think i think it's really important to note jesus was one who came and tipped over the tables he is one who broke the the actual veil tore from the top down right these things broke apart he was you know at that time you call him a radical Right. What do you mean you're eating with sinners and tax collectors and these people? And, and you go, hold on a second. He was breaking apart the conventions of idolatry. And he's continuing to do that to this day. And so it's not that the Bible is not a useful tool. And you've said this many times. You said you could put a gun on a table and it would just sit there. You have to animate that. And I think what's amazing about the Word of God is, well, what is a reminder? What is the Passover meal, Steve? Why would we get together and go, yeah, they brought us out of Egypt, and man, we went through the Red Sea, and it was so awesome. Well, why are we telling each other that? Because we're saying, hey, God is, like, real. And, like, we got to tell our kids about that, right? Hearts and minds, all that stuff. But it's really interesting. I feel like so many people have kind of adopted what was culturally their family's faith, and it never became real to them because no one really said to them, and I, I don't even hear it in my own church, and it's sad. I don't hear the simple thing that I feel like you've told me. Jesus is alive, and he speaks. That in and of itself, like that's what I, I take away from this. I say, hold on. If he's speaking, I'm listening. And you're just saying, try that on for size. What I love about what you're saying, Steve, is you're not saying, hey, let's get a bunch of people saved so I can put it on the rolls and the people back at the church think I've produced. You know, I'm a good sales guy for this Jesus fellow. And I've always rejected that. That always felt hokey to me and wrong. It's like, this is not, we're not sales guys. Thoughts about all that junk? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, you you have invited the folks into our conversations, yeah. into our telephone conversations. And so, you know, I mention this each week because this, what they're experiencing is they're experiencing our telephone conversations. And yeah. there are times when a concept is mentioned where you just have to take a few minutes to process it in your <laughs> mind, you know, to try to get some handle on it. So that you can, you know, at least have a starting point to say, okay, I'm going to come back to that. Let me see if I can even put words to it. Yeah. Um, And so they're getting a chance to experience what, you know, what happens, you know, in our conversations. You mentioned a moment ago about the, um, about what's called the triumphal entry. Well, I mean, the story behind the story. Okay, Jesus is hanging, hanging with his guys and says, hey, look at man, um, my father has something for me to do here, but I need a little transportation to make this happen. So go into the, go into the city square and you're going to see um, a Corvette parked in, in, the dry, in a guy's driveway. And go ahead and bring it to me. And if he stops you, and says, hey, what are you doing with my vet? You're to say to him, the Lord has need of it. And he will immediately release it to you. Of course, I'm not talking about it. It wasn't a Corvette. It was a colt. Mm-hmm. Upon, you know, a donkey that no one had ever ridden on before. Well, that was a prized possession back then. Yeah. Now, We look at that from the miracle of Jesus um, foretelling, if you will, what was to transpire in order to get him what he needed to accomplish the father's, you know, mission at that point. 
But I look at the guy who owned the cult. <laughs> How in the world did you release your prized possession to a bunch of guys you didn't even know just because they said to you, the Lord has need of it? Wow. Yeah. To think that there are people out there that they recognize Jesus's voice, even when it's spoken through another person. And did not hesitate. Of course, go. Well, what that is, that's a picture of the kingdom. That's how the kingdom of God works. See, Jesus speaks. Jesus prescribes, what's he doing? He's carrying out the wishes of the Father. What are the wishes of the Father to execute his plan? This portion of the plan now has, we now have some work to do in this portion of the plan. And here are the resources that I need. And here are the folks that have those resources. Go to them, and if they ask the question, you simply tell them, and they hear it. Hmm. Instantly, they'll release them. Wow. Jesus, I want to be one of those guys. Yep. I want to be so sensitive, so tuned in, so well practiced in learning how to hear your voice that I don't care through whom or through what you speak and communicate. I want to be so in tune. I never miss you speaking to me. Hmm. I all that's where I want to be always. Well, Steve, what you just described is always being with me. See, that's what it is to be with me. Okay, so Jesus goes into the goes into the uh, into Jerusalem. Everybody's having this celebration and praising. Where's the first place he goes? Temple. He goes directly to the to the temple. Now, when you when we talk about this, I want you to think in terms, every, you, Matt, all of us that are listening to this, that what the temple is today is us. Yep. Jesus went immediately to the temple and he went to the folks that are called the money changers. That's how the Bible refers to them. They were actually merchants that took the, the very simple basic provisions that Moses laid out and started using them as a mechanism of exploitation and extraction. And Jesus called them, and again, den of thieves. But what, he's, what he was actually talking to them, the, the word, the, the description and definitions of the words were those who were out to commit theft and plunder, plundering the innocent. So these people were setting up camp, conducting business inside the temple, and the, their means of, of conducting business was as a thief set only to extract, exploit, and to plunder the innocent. Hmm. Well, who are the innocent? The ones who are just going there trying to hook up with God. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what's going on with me. I just, man, I just got to hook up with this guy, whatever it takes. Now, what's fascinating, using a word that both of us have some affection for, is in the, in the New Testament, there are two kinds of thief. There is the thief that operates in stealth. That's the thief that moves around, hides, doesn't want to be seen. And that thief, Jesus described as only comes. The only reason that thief comes is to kill, steal, and destroy. And we, we assign that to Satan all the time. 
We assign that to the devil all the time. He's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, that thief is the thief that comes in hiding, in stealth. And that's the one that Jesus said, hey, if the head of the household knew what time that thief was coming, he would have prepared stuff so that his treasure, the treasure of his household would not be plundered. That's not the thief that, that Jesus is talking about in, in the temple. That was the overt thief. That was the thief that operated um, in the light, or I should say in the light of day. And that thief is there to conduct business for the purpose of plundering the innocent. It's that thief that he did not bind. It's that thief that he turned up, turned every his entire business model upside down and cleared him out. Wow. Well, guess what Jesus does the first time we start talking about listening to him and getting to know him? He goes into that part of our life that is operating like the thief that comes to plunder and exploit the innocent through our business practices that we have validated, you know, in our business model. There are some that are overt, but what he does is he cleans out and says, no, that's not how we conduct business in the kingdom. That's not what we do. Wow. Business is about reciprocating relationships where there's mutual exchange of value. If you, if you are not as happy on the other end of this transaction as you are uh, on your end, that is not good business. You are seeking to exploit or you're being exploited. Get rid of that model in your, in your makeup. My temple does not operate that way. So, so this is enormous, folks. Absolutely mind-numbing enormous. What I think is so incredible about creation is that it has like this infinite resolution. And, you know, the simple is like the leaf, you hold it up and it looks like the tree, right? You go into the DNA and you're like, wow, these sequences are what makes you look who you are. And you're, you're a ginger. Um, what is amazing about this, these pictures, is that they also, Jesus is showing that picture of physically entering this physical temple and coming into this place and, and turning over a model which is extractive. And so, folks, we're in crypto, right? And I always like to kind of bring things back to this because it's what we think about all the time. If you're somebody that's anticipating the Pulse Chain launch, you're somebody who's like, hey, things could be different. Know that there's one who goes into the temple. And what Steve just said is the temple. We are a temple, right? And it's amazing. He says this many, many times. He says to the woman at the well, there will be a there's a time coming when you will not worship on this mountain, but in spirit and in truth. And this idea that he talked about, you know, I'm going to tear this temple down and rebuild it in three days. This idea that, hold on, if we're a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is a counselor who reminds us of everything Jesus said, then wouldn't he do the same thing? This picture of coming in and turning over the model of extraction to one of abundance and what you said is this justice and fairness, right? It's happening today, Steve. You go to the Western Wall right now, there are Hasidic Jews who will take your money because they want to convince you that they are the middleman that will get you to God. That you you come to them, pay them money, they'll put your little thing in the crack of the wall. They'll charge you money. That their prayers are somehow more effective. And it's what you're, you're displaying here is this idea, are you willing to let him into the temple? Well, and it's in a ways. Go ahead, go, go ahead. Well, well, see, all these dots connect when you let him connect them. Yeah. I mean, they were never connected for me before, but it's like, whoa, all of this stuff makes a whole lot of sense. He's talking to the folks and he says, the, the eye is the oil-filled lamp of the body. And if the eye is clear, meaning that the what illumines the eye is an oil, and that oil is reminiscent of a spirit, and that's so a spirit illuminates our eyes. And that spirit can, you know, can increase, decrease. 
And what, and what he says is, if your eye is clear, and if it is without secret agenda, and it is as simple in its intentions, then your whole body will be mobilized to produce light and the revelation of light, and you will be brilliant as light. However, if your eye is dark, if your eye has dark light in it, it will illumine also. But what it will do is it will be filled with the pain-ridden misery of evil and wickedness. And if, you, if your eye is like that, then your whole body will be mobilized to produce darkness and obscurity. And then he says, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Well, in the illustration of the temple, it was so dark that it required him to go in there and kick some booty. Yep. We totally take that model, turn it wrong, you know, upside down model and turn it right side up by completely dismantling it. Okay. Now, here's the punchline that Jesus says in, in the, you know, about the eye. He says, therefore, you do not have the ability, nor do you, have you been given the power to serve two lords. For you will either serve the one and love him and discard the other. You guys know the, know the verse. Okay? And he says, therefore, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot do it. So in that temple, that physical temple on the very first day, you know, you, we are seeing a contrast. We're seeing, on the, we're seeing the opening frame of the story that here is a guy that hears the voice of the Lord through a messenger and does not hesitate to release to the messengers his prized possessions. The other side of that are people who are operating in a business model inside the temple, the sacred place of God, so the first guy's just operating in everyday life. The next group is operating in the sacred place of God. And they are exercising a business model that is designed solely to plunder the innocent. One is serving God. That's the one that releases. The other is serving mammon. That's the one that's exploiting one is in the everyday life. The other is in the temple. Where do you want to operate? Yeah. See? So these things all connect. So, you know, these conversations are all about the kingdom of God, but it's not. This, these are not religious conversations. No. They're no. spiritual in nature because heaven and earth are not separated. Right. This, and this is how we were designed to live, you know, in every aspect of our lives, in business, in finance, in family, everywhere. This is how it's done. All right. I had an epiphany, Steve. You know of some of it. Yeah. And I, I feel like every time I hear these things, I get pictures in my mind, right? Pictures of examples of things because it helps me kind of, you know, put some handles on things and understand them better. And I want to share with you this picture I was given last night. Um, and I want to just kind of feel around the edges of this. So let me, um, let me share my screen here. Um, all right. So here's the picture I was given last night. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, check right this on. out. So check this out. So here, here I am in the middle, right? Top view. And this is what happened to me last night, which is absolutely amazing, is that, you know, what's really been ringing my ear in practice is this idea of who am I listening to and who am I giving authority to speak to me, right? Saying, I want to hear from you, Jesus. I want to hear and I want to give you authority and I want to choose that you would be the only one that would speak to me. And of course, you know, I've dealt with anxiety. I've dealt with all kinds of things that are not um, of him. Fear, 
all kinds of doubt, all kinds of things. And so this picture is like exactly what I saw in all this is that on the left hand side of this, we were talking, you know, privately yesterday and you were talking about this stuff. And I, I made this analogy. I said, you know, it's like, he's a, like Jesus is like a, um, one of these, um, these ships that goes through the ice and icebreaker, it breaks the ice. And you're like, no, hang on a second. And you were super nice to me about this. He said, no, 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 no. Jesus isn't pushing through the mess. He's beyond it. And that was like this, it, it was a switch for me. And so here's what happened to me. This picture was shown on the left-hand side. There's this idea of the, the self, right? God has given us the ability to create. He's made us in his image. And I'm going to kind of tell the story of this picture, and I want you to correct me or to also reinforce. So I'm having this conversation with myself, and I think that the simple things is my wife says, we're going to make brisket, and I'm like, I'm in, right? I love <laughs> smoked meat, but we're making brisket. We're having 30 people over at the house for Easter Sunday, and my wife is hosting. And, of course, my wife is a wonderful host, but I have to cook the meat. And so I said, all right, my favorite thing to cook is brisket. Let's go. Well, that's a choice that I can make. And what's cool about it is I, I study about it and I think about it. And I'm like, all right, I got to get the temperature right. And what kind of smoke are we going to use? And am I going to use a prime brisket? And, you know, how many people are we serving? And I think of all these things. And I'm having that conversation in my mind. And so that can be extrapolated out to so many different things like, hey, what do you want to make? Right? We could make furniture. We could build a building. We could come up with a, a plan. We could measure and we could do these things, right? There's a way that seems right. We make our plans. And so I saw this picture and I was like, when I go my own way and not everything, I mean, is Jesus in brisket? The way it tastes, he seems like he might be. <laughs> this idea that he's given us the ability in this physical world to be able to make decisions and choices. We have this free will. I can choose what meat I want to smoke for Sunday's dinner. But also recognizing that if you're if you're a computer guy, like um, I've I've kind of hung out with a lot of nerds. One of the ways in which you secure a network is you have to close the ports. And in a network, there are many many thousands of ports. And if you leave those ports open, things can get in. And the picture here was this idea that through self, through this self-talk where I do what I want to do, you know what comes through that, Steve? No. Porn. You know what comes through that? All kinds of strategies of getting away with stuff, yeah. taking advantage of systems, taking advantage of people, manipulating circumstances and situations. But also what comes through self is fear uncertainty, doubt, all of these things that are very destructive in nature come through the port that's open, which is the self. And it's very reactive. And so I, I get, I get, and I feel like a lot of people I run into, I, I literally became immobilized. Yeah. I literally became frozen. And what was amazing about this epiphany of this idea of like, hold on a second, if I give authority to, and I say, Lord, you are the only one I give permission to speak to me. Well, that doesn't mean that I don't make briskets. No, no, no. I have this choice to make and this self-talk about, all right. And I thought about this, Steve. I really did. I'm like, okay, I'm going to make sure I, I sit between about one, uh, 250 and 265. And we're going to look at the poundage of this. And we're going to go for at least 12 hours. I'm going to get some uh, beef tallow. And when I do this wrapping of it, I'm going to wrap this in, I'm going to actually wrap it in foil this time instead of butcher paper. And we're going to, we're going to let that thing sit at about 160 and it's going to sit there and it is going to get so juicy. Right. So that is. You make me hungry, man. Yeah, I know. It's so <laughs> awesome. Right. I love it. It's like having a baby, right. You're just like, this is amazing. Well, that's part of the creative aspect of being made in God's image is creative okay. ability. And it could be, you know, Forrest with his music. It could be anything like that. But we have to understand, at least this is my epiphany, that this is the open port. There's a reactive world. And when you said Jesus walked into the temple, 
he walks into our temple, the temple of us. And what's interesting is this left-hand side, which is so reactive, I'm always reacting to the spilled coffee on the table. And all of these things represent to me this idea of what is invading and like a capillary effect soaking up into my you know, paper towels, if you will, and is saturating me with this stench. And it's like, hold on a second. You're saying, no, no, Jesus is alive and he speaks, and he has spoken it into existence. My whole Christian walk, if you will, and story, that even I even say those words and I correct myself in my head, is to say, hold on a second, whose am I? If it is finished, then there is one who is ahead of all of this, that this is all reactive. This is all stuff that is a reaction to what he is doing and that he is not only beyond it, but in front of it. And there's so many examples of that happening. So here's what happens Steve, And it kind of wigged me out a little bit. I'm like, I got to tell Steve about this because this is nuts. So I said over and over and over again, I was like walking out of Walmart saying, Jesus, I only listen to you. I give you authority to speak to me. No, no one else has permission to speak to me. Only you. What do you want to say? And what's funny is I kind of walked differently. I was like, hey, it's kind of cool. <laughs> but the other thing that was needed is I, I was in the middle of the night last night or in the morning. I'm not sure which one it was. I was having this conversation. I was like, Jesus, I want to know. I want to know what you want me to know. I don't even know what to ask, but I want you to tell me what you want me to know. Because I imagine all of these things that are in front of me, the pulse chain launch, Hex and Texan and Texas independence and this idea of unlocking generosity. You've put these things into my mind that these are not small things. I mean, it's one thing to cook a brisket. It's another thing to birth a nation. And I'm like, I don't have the power to control Texas independence, but you do. But I have to re- recognize and realize that it's like when these ideas time has come, that there's a time in which Jesus does his thing and he's not weak. Yeah. And what is amazing to me in this epiphany is he spoke to me in an accent. This is the coolest thing. And this is the story that came out of this. You said that the, the sheep recognized the shepherd's voice. So when I'm thinking about baking a brisket on one hand, I'm thinking, all right, what is the temperature and all this stuff? Watch these YouTube videos, do this stuff. Cool. It's exciting. I love it. You know, I'm going to sit out on the porch. I'm going to just smell the smoke and the meat. And, he, and it's like, it's good. It's really good. Like, yeah, this is awesome. But then on this other hand, I literally am going, hold on a second. There's no open port except Jesus on this side. And this is a side where there is strategy and forward thinking, and progress, and proactivity. And that if I, literally, he speaks in this accent and differentiates himself as the shepherd, and I go, hold on a second. Like, hold on, you're, you're, you're going to give me knowledge and wisdom and information spoken to me. You're going to reinforce it with your scriptures and people. You're going to create opportunities. You're going to open doors. You are going to you're going to create a future that's based on what you made. And it's unique for each person and the dynamic of that because we are a part of a body. And what's unbelievable about this is, Steve, one, it differentiates itself from the voice in my head, this port that's open to the world, a reactive world. And now I feel like, hold on, this differentiated voice is to say, no, no, I am making all things new. I am merging heaven and earth to be one. Without me, you can do nothing. Maybe make a brisket. But ultimately, what my plan is requires that you listen to my voice. And I just go, hold on a second. I remember when I was a kid, and people were like, you need to worship God. I was like, what, what do you mean? Like, he hasn't done anything for me. And then I imagine where I am today, and I go... I do not even have the capabilities to define or to articulate how appreciative I am. Yeah. And it's like, 
you know, it's funny, you shared this with me in, in the context of business and you shared this with, and it's like, hold on. No, he like met me in the same place he met you. And what you've said to me this whole time is like, don't listen to me, ask him. And what's so cool about that is he's verifying the exact same thing he said to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, this is real power, folks. This is real stuff, and it's not – I always felt like God was hiding the ball, that he was far away, that he wasn't accessible. But now I recognize that this open port of the world has been been drowning it out and affecting it, and I've, I've cared more about it, right? When Lambo, when am I going to get the things? And, you know, and all of the pressures of this world of scarcity model that I'm like, I got to provide for my family. I've got to be like, I got to produce, I got to compete. And it's like, hold on guys, this whole story that we're telling here with the pulse chain and all these things, these tools that we want to animate, I really truly feel like if we understand this, that all of these things, all of these resources and all of these tools are at our disposal, not out of our own strength of manipulation of the tools, but out of the inspiration of when to use those tools for the purposes of accomplishing his plan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just been brought into a bigger oh. game than you are. Oh my gosh, dude, it just blows my mind. But now that I think about it, Steve, I go, you know, What's he about to do? Yeah. What's he about to do? And, and do are we actually living at this time, Steve? Are we literally at this moment, which is so pivotal? And now when I look at crises, and you said this to me early on when we started talking, you were like, all these things have to happen. Yeah. Like these, don't, don't be frustrated and sad about the times of crisis. But these are the times of change. And these are the times that... You know, if Jesus is ahead and he's out there and he's working out this plan, there everyone else is reacting. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, where do you want to be? And you know what I also love about this? This is just kind of my last part of this epiphany. Delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I've always misunderstood that, thinking that when Lambo, I'm going to get my Lambo. And you know what he's really saying? And I've just clearly seen this. I've seen it many, many times over, especially in adopting my son, is that he will rewire your heart to have desires that are aligned with his desires. And what's amazing about that is the things I thought would bring me joy are empty. Like winning this deal, getting this money, having this bank account, all of these things are not, it's almost like you can't enjoy them because the definition of enjoyment isn't based on the world. It's based on what he is doing in you. And what is the byproduct of that? He's like, no, no, you won't, you won't be looking at your bank balance and cheering. You'll be resting in me regardless of your circumstances. And I go, hold on a second. The incentive token of Jesus himself is peace. And that's why when I meet you and I shake your hand and I go, okay, this guy's got something different going on here. And the Lord says, listen, listen, this is the real stuff. And then you go, hey, don't listen to me. Yeah, I'll I'll share with you what he's spoken to me. And then he says the same thing to me. Folks, this is not reserved for Steve and me. We're we're a couple of a couple of guys that are walking through this path. What would you say to people who think, "Oh man, I'm never going to get there." Steve, man, you've been doing this for 30 years, and it's like, you know, Jesus is speaking to you. I don't even know how to like differentiate this stuff. What are you guys talking about? What would you say to somebody who's dealing with this? They're in the midst of the muck, and they're in this, and I think is potentially breaking apart their their construct of what they think this thing is, and it's. They're seeing cracks in the foundation. What would you say? Well, first thing I'd say say is you are and you are entering into Jesus's theater of light, um, which is an indication that you're on the right path because you are actually seeing the world that you live in and have cl- and are claiming is yours, and it's full of destruction. And so you are experiencing the true nature of that world. 
Now, there's a couple of things that we, I mean, we now have the choice, if you will. We now have the liberty to exercise our choice about how we're going to deal with that. We can take a woe is me approach. Um, look at how that dastardly world, you know, the world is so cruel. It's, it's, it's against me. Well, you know, you're right. It is against you. Okay? But it's against everybody who operates in that world. And it doesn't matter where you are on the happiness scale at any point in time. Inside that world, you're experiencing what its true nature is. So now, what do you want to do about that? Do you want to do you want to stay in there? Do you want to become an over somebody who can beat that world at its own game and try to get on top? Or what is the reward for you there? Oh, you get to be successful. Isn't it fascinating that almost without exception, success is related to having a lot of money? And it doesn't matter how screwed up the rest of your life is. Right. If you made a lot of money, you're successful. That's the nature of that world. See, it is very, very destructive. It has no life in it. It doesn't think like God thinks, so it has no wisdom in it. It promises you, but it never delivers on its promise. It tells you that you can be free while there's no provision for freedom in it. There is nothing there but death, destruction, darkness, obscurity. That's what's there. And Jesus is giving you the blessing of seeing it for what it is. Hard. Man, it just feels like it's going to rip you apart. But then he says, hey, listen, now that you see it, what do you want to do about it? Hey, there's you have options. Now, the options aren't inside that world. It just, you know, it may give you a little relief for a little while, but eventually, man, that is a very sketchy place. That's the way it works. Yeah. It has neither life nor wisdom in it. Okay. Now that's the story of the prodigal son, right? The son who left did not recognize the true nature of his father and the house that his father had created for him and his brother until he experienced what it was not. And once he saw it for what it was, an extraction, explo exploitation world, where he was eating the slop of pigs until he saw that and saw what that world thought of him. See, that's the deal. He was observing what that world actually thought of him. Not only what it did to him, but what it did to him was preceded by what it thought of him. Nothing better than a pig worthy of eating slop. But it wasn't until he saw that that he actually realized, oh, my father. Man, he's not as big a jerk as I thought he was. <laughs> what he built was actually very cool. For the first time I'm seeing that my father treats his servants better than this world treats those who are sons of the king. Oh. Wow. Guess what? The elder son didn't see who the father was until he saw the father not only responding to his younger brother, but also to him. Yep. And until we see the father's true nature and character, we really have no appreciation for what he has built. Wow. But the other world gives us a chance to see that by contrast. Yeah. So if the person finds it, we've all been there. Yeah. You know, you came to the end of yourself. What? I wouldn't see it. the way I would offer it is you weren't coming to the end of yourself. You were just seeing what yourself could produce right. and what it thought of you. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, so how, how do you feel about that? <laughs> well, yeah, but it, it's, it, it, it's, it's fruit is not even fruit. You know, we go our own way and, you know, 
It's amazing. Hey, so I want to, I want to, we're going to do something new. Mm. This is, this is new. And this is, I'm picking on somebody in the chat and I'm not picking on them in a, in a mean way. I'm picking them on a way and I want to, this is a real practical thing, Steve. So I'm throwing you a curve ball and I know you can hit the curve ball. Okay. You ready for this one? Okay. We'll, we'll we see if a, that's true. We have a friend in the chat named pineapple love. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to read you a bunch of things, and I want you to take this in and respond. Okay. Jesus came down here to teach us who we really are, powerful beings just like him. Your energy being has been trapped here inside this meat suit body, which is not really you. Meditation is the only way to access to your powerful beings. Meditation. Once you vibrate at your higher frequency state of consciousness, all low frequency things cannot affect you, and you cannot you can access your your power manifesting reality. All physical dimension is low frequency, high density. That's why you cannot see higher dimensions, high frequency realm, who you really are. You need to first remove your ego mind identity. Actually, we are love and wisdom in higher realm, unconditional love energy. That's what we are. It's all energy. You are energy beings. If you want to know the truth, do not think, feel. You can feel it in your stomach, not your head. Learn how to meditate. Jesus meditates. Missing years, Jesus. Yes, the kingdom is within you, literally, your body. So start meditate, people not religions, mind control you to slaves. Your body is a temple, literally. Laughing. The power that be the top of pyramid people, they know this, that we are powerful beings like Jesus. They are so scared if all of us awaken with higher consciousness. If you are operating at low frequency state, you cannot access to God or Jesus. Yes, clear your mind first by meditating, meaning staying in the present state to access the truth, higher realm. It is very hard to stop thinking. Thinking is not real you. Be careful if it can be Satan's mind control voice pretending to be your God. I love Richard Hart. Hex pulse all the way. All physical stuff in this dimension, just temporary, not eternal, not true real happiness. Access external happiness and uncondition is through meditation. Low frequency state equals earth. Good. No, no. We are unconditional love and wisdom in higher realm where we came from. Good night, folks. Okay. Here's what's amazing to me. You said to me before, you said, when you start listening to Jesus directly, like the all of heaven and earth is activated. What's amazing to me is this series of content in the midst of all the other comments. And it's interesting that one would come into the chat to try to... almost obscure the message. What is your sense of all that I read? Well, first of all, the, the person, what, what they were sharing is very important to them. True. And so it is reflecting part of their own process and journey and experimenting with life and, you know, and things of that nature. Um, what they wrote, they obviously took time to think about what they were writing, um, to articulate it as well as they can, uh, and to speak what for them is has produced some value to them. Yep. Okay. Well, okay. That's a journey. That is a that is a part of it. And so, the the question I the questions that were coming into my mind as I was, as I was reading that is, as I was appreciating what they were sharing, 
my question was, well, what is your destination? Is your destination improving you or is your destination getting to know who Jesus is? What is the destination that that path is going to take you? What is the end state of where you're going? Okay. For me, I'm, I'm not, I didn't start this, this is my uh, path. I didn't start this to make a better me. I started this because I wanted to know who the creator was. Because until I got to know him, I recognized I didn't have a clue what his creation was about. And so the objective was not improving me. The objective was to get to know him. Now, what I discovered was, as I got to know him, guess what he was doing to me? He was improving me. And when he was improving me, he was making, more, making me more sensitive to, in, my, in the attributes of my senses, emotional, spiritual, physical, mental, all of those senses that were given to us in order to operate, you know, in the, in the dimension that we're operating in. He didn't, he didn't create me to live in the, you know, live in the ocean. He created me to live on the land. So I have been given the attributes that enable me to best function on the land. See? And so those are pictures of how he creates us, creates beings to operate at the highest level in the dimension they were created to operate in. Now, what's interesting is that the human is the only being in God's creation that operates in both the, both the spiritual and the material heaven and earth at the same time. We're the only beings that can do that. Now, we don't know how to do it. Some of us are learning. This person is, act, is telling us how they're going about learning how to do that. I don't understand the nature of frequencies and how that work but neither do I understand how a tuning fork works. Right. I just observe that it does. Now, do I need to know how the tuning fork works in order to, you know, hear that it's, you know, it's pitch? No, my senses recognize the pitch. See? So this person is describing that, and I'd say, okay, if we were to be sitting across the table like you and I do or on the phone, I'd say, okay, what is your destination? Mm -hmm. Where are you? Where do you want this experience to take you? Is it a better you? Or is it getting to know Jesus, the author and perfecter of all that you see? I have my choice. What's your choice? Yeah. And that you know, would be, that's how I would respond to them. You know what's I, what I love about that response, Steve? And I had a feeling that you would bring something unique to the table. Here's the thing that I, I find. Every time I go to these events and stuff, nobody wants to talk to me about crypto. Mm -hmm. They want to talk to me about spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And I love it because i that's my favorite thing to talk about. What's amazing, though, is I'm really interested in hyper-dimensional physics. I'm really mm -hmm. interested in all of the, the unknowns. I'm super curious about all that's here, right? I love hearing about the these... Um, uh, these Navy pilots who encountered these vehicles that operate outside of our physics. I'm fascinating with, with um, the double slit experiment and Schrodinger's cat and observation and the collapse of the waveform. I'm so interested in understanding this creation. And so when I hear people that are looking for the Higgs boson, by smashing things together in a particle accelerator and thinking that they're saying this is the God particle. What's amazing about what you have shared with me is that there is nothing that exists on this world that you can possibly contemplate that Jesus doesn't have an opinion about. Yeah, everything. Everything. And so I think what's really fascinating about it is I think all things point to him. Yeah. So let's say it's people that are looking at ancient technology and they're looking at how did someone possibly create out of rose granite this perfection when everything that we see that came after that and what we assume 
is that we cannot do this with pounding stones and copper chisels. And we see things like, wow, was there something before this time? And we, we, you know, we're examining these things. We see writings from all over the place and pyramids and all these things. I'm so fascinated with this. But here's what I'm seeing. Whenever I listen, whether it's in medical, whether it's in physics, whether it's in mathematics, whether it's in climate change people, whatever it may be, I see this longing in people. And it's pretty much universal across the board. And what's interesting is as they continue to dive deeper and deeper and get to the quantum level, or is it string theory? Is it this theory? Is it the theory of everything? Is what they keep coming back to is, I think it's leading all to the same exact place because it in its creation is a reflection of its creator. And it's surprising to me that it's like the deeper you get into these things, the more you see the architect himself. Yes. Yes. And what I love about what your response was to pineapple love, and I said I was going to be nice and pick on pineapple love. What you would expect from Christian, Steve, is not what you're providing and not what I'm providing. I think what's so incredible about this conversation is that what is love of someone, right? There's some fundamental things I know, and that is we're created in the image of God, and we're in a an interesting place right now. And it feels to me after all I've experienced that this is not how it was. This is not what I would call true life. It's not all things in its fullest, but it is groaning and growing and moving towards this point because Jesus is out ahead and finishing, right? He finished this work of the, of the justice of it all. And we move forward. And what's amazing is I look at Revelation, I look at these things and to say there's a new heaven and a new earth. Well, what would a man say when these things become one? And what is the promise of the kingdom of God? And what's amazing about it is that he's allowing us to make choices that can make the kingdom come. Yeah. And I think what's really amazing is I think a lot of people have given up and they say, well, you know, this is just, um, I'm going to get my, my ticket to heaven. And that this is just a waypoint um, and that this, quote unquote, is not our home. What would you say to people who are just saying, you know, I just need to get my fire insurance and get out of get out of hell free card. And, you know, this is, you know, this will all melt away. And, you know, it's uh, this ethereal heaven where I've got a harp and I wear a diaper on a cloud. Um. I would start with probably something that doesn't seem like a direct answer, but it, but it leads to the answer. Um, the, the Apostle Paul uses this description that our, our conflict, our struggle, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, mm. but against, and then he lists a whole hierarchy of angelic beings within his structure. The structure of his operation, Print, you know, powers, principalities, rulers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, if you break that down into the common vernacular, um, our issue isn't against people. People are not our enemy. Amen. Well, what is our enemy? Spiritual powers that are trying to manipulate people in order to make them appear as if they are our enemy or to set us in opposition to them. Wow. They to us. So if I wanted to if I wanted to fix that problem, what would I do? I deal with the source of the problem. See? Now we're getting into the spiritual part. So here how do we get to the solution of the spiritual part? The kingdom of darkness will allow us to do virtually anything and it will support us in our endeavor. You want to be the president? It'll help you get there. You want to be a doctor? It'll help you get there. You want to be a missionary? It'll help you get there. You want to be the greatest preacher on the planet? It'll help you get there. There's only one thing it will not, cannot tolerate, 
And that is a man or a woman who says, Jesus, I want to learn to hear your voice. That is the one thing that dimension cannot tolerate. It will do anything and everything in its power to keep that from happening. The only problem is it's running up against a divine decree. And that decree is, Jesus issued is, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Hear. Wow. There is no power that exists in creation that will keep someone from learning to hear if that's how they have exercised their personal choice to learn. Not one thing. If pineapple wants to learn, if that if pineapple's ambition is to learn to hear Jesus's voice, to know who he is, to hang out with him and learn about all that he has for that person, the path they are on will lead them exactly to that end. And it doesn't matter how much how much noise comes at you. You exercise that choice. Jesus says, then you will hear. All right. Now, so now let's look at your at your question, your question about pineapple and, you know, the response and how the Christian community would would respond and things of that nature. Well, it's irrelevant what the Christian community is going to respond because the Christian community is noise. Yeah. It's interested in theological acceptance, doctrinal um, conformity. It's not interested in Jesus, no matter how much it tells you that it is. And the way that you know it is if you say to it, if I want to hear Jesus's voice and do only what he says, will this denomination, this Christian community, allow me to do whatever it is he has me do in order to get there? The first answer will be yes, of course. Okay, so then you start saying, well, what if? Guess what will eventually happen? It will start locking you into a doctrinal framework that is acceptable to them. Well, okay, that's an option. You can go down that path if you want. If you're, if you're, total interest is to learn to hear Jesus's voice, guess what? That ops, that obstacle will not deter you one bit because he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So it doesn't matter. What matters is the choice. That's all that matters. Now, whatever path the person goes on, it doesn't matter they're going to end up at that destination point because that's where they have set their choice. Isn't that amazing? Like, didn't Peter lop off the guard's ear? Malcolmus, yep. Whose name means king. Isn't it amazing that it was in the ear? Yeah. No, dude, Peter, preserve the ear. As long as he has ears to hear, he has opportunity to see me for who I am. What I love about that is that that removes judgment yeah. of, of, of man, right? And what I love about you and, and you exercising and, and showing me this stuff is that there's no room for judgment in the sense that If it is about hearing his voice, this is the interesting thing. Man wants to build systems and wants to control situations. And you think about this idea of ruling and having dominion and doing those things. You know, I love watching these guys build these uh, primitive buildings. They're using mud and sticks and they're in the middle of some field somewhere. And it's amazing what's around them that they can create a shelter with. And it's 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 interesting how that relates to this ability of what we want to rule over and conform to of what we would need to keep the 
the rain off our heads or the sun off our backs or, you know, the warmth of the fire or whatever it may be when you kind of reduce these things down is that we want to, we want to have control. And, you know, you think about it, it's like you said, you can't serve God and mammon. I was thinking about my friends that are, you know, in the church and I've served a lot of ministries and a lot of churches and, there's always this challenge that pastors have because there's this desire to run the business of church. And there's this responsibility of paying staff and doing the things that are, would be considered kind of business-like. Like, I mean, these people expect to get paid. And then what, what do you do to compromise these things in these structures that we've built? Well, we kind of overbuilt the building and, you know, energy prices are high and inflation's coming. And so now I've got to think differently rather than listening to Jesus's voice. Now I got to preach a sermon on people giving money because we're, we're over our heads. And it's so these distractions, it's that coffee that's spilled on the table that even in the systems by which we hope to usher people into a relationship with Jesus has a tremendous amount of noise. And what I love about this is this is this picture of true decentralization. If we are temples of the Holy spirit, and if we have ears to hear, that there's no middleman, there's no counterparty. It's direct to the source. Now, there's amazing tools that can be used in all that. Like I, I created that image. You know, I'm like, that's a tool. I used like some some software, and I said, hey, this is how I kind of see it. But this isn't it. It's a derivative of what I experienced because I wanted to communicate something that I don't even have the words to communicate. Well, that's a pretty powerful. Um image if if i can you you extended to me the opportunity to correct not it yeah i'll just give you additional thing to think about on this and again this is how we are taught uh, to think your where you stand um i would call that the person mm -hmm. see the we, we have been taught all kinds of things that are, if you step outside of them and just listen to them and just let them tell you what their message is, don't insert what you think it means. Just step back and just listen to the message that those words are telling us. Okay. One of them is human nature. Human nature is toast. This thing is vile. It does all this stuff. And so there is, a, there is an assertion about human nature that it is inherently wicked and evil. Well, you know, there are people that are wicked and evil. But if you assign that to human nature, then how do you explain those people that are so gracious and giving and kind especially to people who are in trouble. Yeah. Thailand experiences this horrific tidal wave of destruction and people in this country and others just flooded them with care and help and support. Katrina, we have a disaster. People flood in there to help and support. Well, guess what? That's human nature too. Yeah. So is the issue human nature? What I would submit to you is the issue is not human nature. Human nature was made in the likeness of God, and it's in the process of being developed into the nature and character of God. So now let's go back to your, we'll come back to bacon sandwich in a second, but go back to your little graph. Yeah. See, the person in the middle, you, you're the person. And as the person, you have all the attributes the image attributes of God. You walk, you talk, you speak, you think, you reason, you calculate, you're mobile. You have all of those external uh, capabilities of, of God in his image. But you also have his, his likeness built in you, which is his nature and character the image he gave you when you were born. His likeness he develops 
over time. You always have it, human nature. You always have it. It just is being going to be developed. So how is that nature going to be developed? Oh, enter the self. Now, remember um, the story in the garden? We're going back there again. And um, Eve has her, uh, her little... Um, session with the serpent and she eats and then Adam follows her and then Jehovah comes into the garden and they're terrified and he looks at them and the you know where are you what have you been doing uh well we are hiding why are you hiding well the woman you gave me she she did this you know she did this deal she screwed up and I I don't know. She just tricked me into doing this thing. I don't. I don't know what happened. Next blame thing, her, I, blame her. Next thing I know, I'm butt naked. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's the language: Who stood before you to point out to you that you were naked? Who was it that stood before you that did that? Oh, but since you've done that, now by the way. He took fig leaves and covered them, right? Well, they covered themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, Adam and Eve, they, yeah. they covered yeah. themselves, right? Okay. I wonder how long it took them to figure out that that was an option that would work. I wonder how long they had to, what was the process that they had to go through to observe the raw materials that were around them and hmm. then figure out how to string these things together so that they would hold together. To, so, you know, I don't think that was a 15 minute calculation. My guess is that probably took some time. So, Jehovah, here he is, he waits until they figure this whole thing out. Yeah. Right? Why? Because it's important for them to recognize what just happened, for them to experience through the activity of their life what was going on so that then they gave explanation and then he had a basis of conversation with them. So they go through this whole thing and then Jehovah says to him, who did this? And the woman says, you know, Eve says, yeah, this serpent, man, he did this thing. And so if you go into the, into the definitions of the vocabulary um, of the words, Jehovah says to him, because you have accomplished this, you have condemned the entirety of the earth. Every cattle, everything that creeps, meant everything has now entered into this state of condemnation. Okay, that's a term I'm using for most people to, to get that. And then he looks, he looks at Eve and he, and he, or I should say, he looks at the serpent and he says, because you have done this, there will be enmity, hatred, and conflict between your seed and the seed of the woman. What is the seed of the serpent? What? I mean, are there just a bunch of snakes running around that are overwhelming everything? And now all the women in the world are, and everywhere they go, they go, there's some snake that is sitting there nipping at their heel. No. Okay. Jesus, what are you talking about there? What is this self? I mean, what is this seed that you're talking about that's going to be in conflict with the seed of the woman? What does that look like? That, in our common vernacular, is the self. Yeah. The self is, in, in, the, in the language of computerese that we were talking about yesterday, that kind of led to your epiphany and some of these other things, is that's the, mal the malware that was injected into the operating system of the man, both male and female. And that self is not the same as the person. That self is what's there, that when we think, we're actually in dialogue with the self. 
The key is that in, in practice over time is we no longer dialogue with the self, what we call thinking, we dialogue with Jesus. We learn to do that. So the person in the middle has a choice about whether he's going to dialogue with the self or he's going to dialogue with Jesus. And when Jesus says, hey, listen, man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, what is he saying? Di learn to dialogue with God. Your inner thoughts are communicating and talking with God, not with yourself. Hmm. Yourself will get you into all kinds of trouble. It'll promise you all kinds of stuff, but trust me, it's all spilt coffee. Okay? Learn to talk to me, not talk to yourself. Cut that off. And when you learn to cut that dialogue off with yourself, what you do is you shut the door on evil. Wow. Oh, Lord. I think that might be worth learning how to do. Are you willing <laughs> to teach me how to do that? Yeah. Because it sounds really good. He says, sure, Steve, follow me, man. Happy to do it. Wow. And that's that's so big, Steve. And this is the thing that, you know, I've, I encountered this before most people who are watching this stream, right? You and I have had these. And I've had some things that I've really pushed back on with you. And what I love about how you've responded is it's been consistent since day one. And what you're doing is you're inviting me into a direct conversation with the author of the book, of all of it. Yeah. And what I love about that is it's it's so pure and so simple. And it's, it's also that you don't need a middleman. You've never once tried to step in the middle and say, oh yeah, follow this thing I wrote. You know, I'm, I'm the new guy on the scene. This is my new religion. But you said, no, 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 no. To look at this world as upside down and to say, hold on. And, and that's the funny thing about my son. It's like, this is like a life hack. It's like a, a cheat code. It's an amazing thing to say, hold on. Is infinite intelligence, is infinite knowledge, is infinite? Well, guess what? It's a journey. And, you know, the church would call it sanctification, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is you say he made you in his image, but he's conforming you to his likeness yeah. and that that's a process. And it's really interesting how the scriptures reinforce that and say things like, hey, you're, you started out drinking milk like a baby and it had everything you needed in it. But no, there's a time when you have to eat meat and grow up and be. And I think about that, this idea of, well, what are the plans then? If there is milk and there is meat, that means that there is a plan because the milk and meat would not exist unless there was a progression. Yeah. And that's powerful stuff. But I also want to recognize this. The bacon sandwich, yeah. awesome, awesome guy. Bacon. Awesome guy. And I love bacon sandwiches, by the way, just to, to make that official. But I was exactly in this spot. Okay. So I want to relate to this because this is where I used to be. Am I wrong to feel that I don't need a relationship with Jesus or God to walk a righteous path in life? And this is the thing that I I felt. Remember I told you that story about the, the, the church lady who lost her glasses in the river? Yeah. And I dove down and I found them after going down multiple times. And she's like, praise Jesus, my glasses are found. And I'm like, no, praise Matt. Yeah. You know, I'm a 12-year-old kid. And so I heard all this stuff, and it really was dissonant to me. It's like, man, this Jesus character is taking credit for everything. And it's like, hold on, do you not recognize that I'm right here, and I'm doing some good things, and I'm trying to do the right thing, and life isn't just you know, woo-woo spiritual stuff all the time. I still have to go to work, and I still have to drive the truck, and I'm a practical guy, and, you know, you fancy lads can talk about your Jesus all you want. I got stuff to do. I'm, I'm, I'm juxtaposing this kind of view. What do you say to someone that's in that situation? It's like, dude, you know, I, I in a way, don't see a real need for this stuff. Well, I, I think what I would say is in the question is, if you will, the, I'm going to use the term revelation, is 
the revelation of the power of our choice and just how much God respects that. Yeah. So if bacon sandwich has a has a standard of of behavior that is moral, ethical, and seeks no um, exploitation of other people, you know, and there's a standard there. God isn't going to intrude in that. Um, at least not in the way that I am, I mean, anything I've ever understood about him. He so respects that he is given choice if that's how Big and Sandwich want has chosen to use their authority to rule, beginning with their own life in this manner, God is, go for it, man. Do it. Do it. There's, you have the authority to do exactly that, to live a moral, ethical, righteous life without relationship with Jesus. That is absolutely true. You can do that. Okay. Now, the question is, is that going to be sufficient for you? Maybe right now it's, it's, it's fine. If you, if you find at some point in time that isn't working out or it's not sufficient or you find that you're coming to the end of something, then the thing I would suggest is remember these conversations. Remember these, yeah. these episodes. You know, until then, enjoy your life. You have the authority yeah. to rule it. You know, G Jesus said, um, it's not those that are well that need a physician. Yeah. It's funny that you say that, though. That I, I'm reflecting on my own experience. Up till 28, I was like, man, I got this thing by the, the, the shorts, man. I got this stuff. Like, I got the bull by the horns. You know, and I was muscling everything and it was conforming to my muscling. I mean, I was kicking ass and taking names, man. I, I look at you, you were, you're playing professional baseball. That is the hardest thing to get to the show. And it's amazing that it, it seems to me God's grace and all this, but I found myself even after having these experiences of going, I, I need to know this guy. I need to understand this better. I still had debilitating anxiety that was health related. And then also I'm sure spiritually motivated. And even as of like last night, understanding and having things revealed. And I think that's one, one of the things that's really unique is this idea of that. It's almost like God's cut, cut you in on the deal. And he's like, Hey, I've got things that are just for you. I meet you right where you are with exactly the situations you're dealing with, and I will show you the way. And I feel like it's custom tailored, right? It's not one size fits Absolutely. all. Custom tailored, yep. Because it's a direct connect. It's not through a mediator. It's not through a derivative. It's like, and I think that that's the thing. You know, my grandmother who was, you know, amazing lady, she said, um, and she keep things really simple. She say he's always been enough. Yeah, and I just love that, you know. And she could rest and rest in Jesus. She was just like he's always been enough. And in a way, it's like my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know, I, I remember years ago I started writing down what Jesus was saying to me. And you know, what he said to me, and it was like over and over. Trust me, and I'll show you. I, I can't. I, I wrote that a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Trust me, and I'll show you. That's one. You're my son and I love you. And I will free you from all addiction. Yeah. Those are the things I wrote. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, that these are things that are for you for you, custom tailored for you at that time. And this dialogue does not require a middleman. But bacon sandwich. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And, and Steve, I just appreciate your, your approach and your perspective because, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't feel like, I feel like a lot of the, the church that I've learned about is trying to force a, a square peg in a round hole. It's well, trying I, to get ahead of things. It's trying to force, force a subject that may not be in the right time. Well, we, a lot of this is because we, we, 
have been taught to accept and presume certain things. Right. So it's, it's not like anybody's out there really waking up in the morning and saying, let's see, how many ways can I screw people up today? <laughs> you know, let's see, how many ways can I get them locked into this religious mindset that I've got? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. See, it's not how we think. Yeah. We, we, the overwhelming majority of us think in terms of that are decent. Yeah. You know, that I wrote a paper on the mystery of lawlessness. And the way I started it was, okay, let's say you get a hundred people together and you say, all right, all of those people who have chosen to live their life lawlessly, would you please raise your hand? And I said, okay, how many people you think are going to raise their hand? And in the paper, I say, my guess is none. Because 98% of the people are probably going to think they're generally law-abiding, decent human beings. And the other two who, are, who aren't don't want you to know about it. Correct. See? Well, okay. So if that's the case, then why, if the overwhelming majority of people are choosing, you know, see themselves as law-abiding, decent, caring human beings, then why are we surrounded by and saturated with lawlessness? Why are we always having to look over our shoulder? Why are we always having to be careful about who's going to rip us off? I mean, our kids can't even go outside and play in the yard anymore because our poor wives are terrified that somebody's going to run by and kidnap them. Yeah. You know, I mean, what's up with this? Well, it's because the, the way the scriptures, Paul refers it to the spirit of, you know, the spirit of this age or Jesus describes it as the ruler of this age or the ruler of this world. Now we're back to our spiritual part of our conversation. There is a kingdom of, that is dark in its intentions that inserts itself in virtually everything we do. And that kingdom is about interested in only one thing, and that is subjugating us and using us to accomplish their objectives. So compliance is the only thing they're interested in. So bacon sandwich is now asking a question, my guess is based on some perspective that they have, that he, he has been shown that says, okay, if you don't conform to get to know and call Jesus your Lord and Savior and all of that stuff, then you're going to hell and you have no ability to live a righteous, moral, ethical life. Why? Because the church is a product of this upside down world that only tolerates compliance. It cannot tolerate the liberty of choice. And yet God himself not only tolerates it and grants it, he respects it at the highest order. If you don't want to hang with me, I'm not going to force you to do that. Wow. You have that choice. It's you're either interested or you're not. It's your choice. And I gave you that choice because I'm inviting you to rule my creation with me. Well, look and at the begin with your own life. And look at the rich young ruler. I mean, it's such a great story, right? He's, like, he's so rich and he's like, go sell all your stuff and follow me. And he's like, oh, man. Check. Let me think on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I got all the stuff, you know, and that's the thing I think is really interesting is that's what that's what gave me perspective of seeing my dad in the casket, to be honest with you. It was so real, right? It's like, you know, you had so many plans, you had some of these things and here he is gone. Right. And it's very final. Right. And you're yeah. just sitting there and you're like, and I think that, you know, I turned 50 and I, I just look at it and I just think about the future. Right. When before all of this, I was like, you know, almost as if, yeah, they got the world by the, on a string. And I, 
the more I reflect on the shortness of this life, because that's the, the, I think that's the luxury of the young person is to not have to worry about these things or to not think about these things. But I'm, I'm so thankful that my dad, when he was 71, Jesus got a hold of him. Yeah. And, you know, and then I think about the thief on the cross, right? And here we are on Good Friday, right? And I love it so much because it's always been such a comfort to me to know that there are two criminals either side of Jesus. And he says to one, today, you'll be with me in paradise. After and their choice. After their choice. Exactly. After they exercise their choice. And you know what's so amazing about this is they didn't jump off the cross and go get baptized. There wasn't like, well, you need to go through a catechism in order for you to get in. And I, I love it. It's so pure. And it's so, and I think that's the neat thing about coming to him. And, and, and I also want to give credit to the scriptures themselves because they've recorded these things as a tool and as a reminder. And to me, I don't want anyone to assume that Steve and I aren't interested in the scriptures yeah. because actually they are very robust and an amazing tool, but we don't worship a book. We don't worship paper and ink. We worship the author of the book, but the book as a reminder is just like, it's actually a really nice condensed way of saying, remember, remember when this happened? Remember that? And of course, what do we talk about all the time, Steve? Man, he's blowing my mind. Look at this miracle. Look what I saw to the dollar into the day. You know, he rarely shows up early. It seems like he's always right on time. Yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, I think about worship too, is that you go into this church and these people are like, well, why are you guys all like fry, flying your freaky flag? You know, why are some people got their hands up? Why are some people clapping? And then why do you see such joy on some people? And some people are just scared to even be there. <laughs> and I think that we've got this, we've got this, it's almost like a hot box, right? It's like, we're going to, you know, corral you into this thing and then chop off your head. And what I love about what's happening here, really since I started this channel and everything, is that I feel, I deeply feel that God is using these tools of our age of technology and to me, the money. And I, I told you that story about how I got into this old house and found this, these coins. You know, I'm praying and I'm like, Lord, show me what to focus on, what to do. And he's like, I've hidden something for you in the house and it's this pill bottle. And he speaks through that. Like I get more and more from that every time I think about it. He's like, no, no, no. You remember when you took Xanax? You remember that? And you were scared. You were scared because you wanted this to go away. And man created this thing, these benzos. And it makes you, when you take one of these benzos, you know what it does? It's like a warm blanket just came out of the dryer. And it's wrapped mm -hmm. around you. And you're just like... And he says, man made that. I didn't make that. And I'm going to put the money inside of this bottle. Everybody's chasing after the money. When Lambo. But you need to recognize that this is just a tool. But I'm going to attract people to this. And, you know, I feel like you're saying to me and what you've given me the permission and what this whole series has been about is to say, folks, just like every great story, a man who wants something, he wants the glory. He wants all of the things that the life brings, the Lambos, the Rolexes, the fancy clothes, or whatever, or the recognition from the haters that he is great, the approval of men. And in the process of going after that thing that he think will bring him the ultimate glory and peace, he discovers something greater. Yeah, It's every great story that has ever been written, and it's the redemption of the human soul. Yeah, And that's what God, he's been doing it since the beginning. He's doing it right now, and he continues to do it. And the question is, do you want to be a part of that story? Because if the kingdom of heaven is near which is amazing. He said that it's near. Yeah. Hold on. That does that means it's not far. Yeah. It's near. It's right on your lips. Yeah. And if he's speaking to us, he's creating. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. He absolutely. spoke it into existence. So will you extrapolate that one concept before we wrap things up? He spoke it into existence and he continues to speak and that creates, what does that mean? Well, we, to a lot of us, uh, again, this is, goes back to our, you know, back to the way we've been, we've been trained is, you know, we will readily, anybody who has uh, read the, the Bible or, you know, buys into the creation account, you know, they'll, they'll refer to the Hebrew writers saying that, um, that we know that all things that are visible um, became visible through the word of God. By faith, we understand these things, which is by faith is a whole different discussion than this one. But we understand that the things that were intangible were created through what he spoke. And that word is Rhema, the spoken word. So we'll look back and say, God created everything through what he spoke. Well, okay, Jesus says in his first response to the first temptation by, by the devil in the wilderness, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, religion will turn that word of God into the Bible. Right. But that isn't, that isn't what he said in any way, shape, or form, because he says, then out of the word of mouth, and not only that, the rhema word, which is a spoken word. So man lives by every spoken word that comes out of the mouth of God. Well, when words come out of our mouth, what do we call that? Speech. Talking. Talking. Right? We're, we're yakking together. You know, people are involved in our conversation. We're talking back and forth. Well, that's that's what it is. That's how man lives in dialogue with God. Well, when he speaks, when he speaks to us, when Jesus speaks to us, what is he doing? He's not only telling us things, you know, that we need to know, places we need to go, counsel we need to have, you know, information that will be helpful, all kinds of things. But when he speaks, He's likewise creating in the same way that he created the heavens and the earth through what he spoke. Okay, now let me give you an example of this, right? Your own, your own, you know, discussion with me the other day about, you know, you had to lay off your people. You're all de dejected and depressed and upset. You go to lunch with a friend that had been, you know, put on the calendar three or four weeks beforehand, how many of her weeks before you slump in the chair, you tell the story. Yeah. I went to this thing after laying off 15 of my closest friends because the money was gone and I was completely, I'd never done it before and it wrecked me. And I find myself at this lunch with this guy and I, and I literally said to him, Steve, why in the world are we meeting? Hmm. And he told me, he said, this company is for sale. And I wanted you to know, and this company was doing $32 million in revenue. And I had just researched it the week before, before everything had crashed. I said, how much are they asking? And this is a big company, two hundred, well, 150 employees. And he said, um, $5 million. And as soon as I heard that, I knew we would own it. We bought it for $1.35 million and they wrote off $10 million in debt. I bought a $32 million company for $1.35 million because the bank wanted to get out of it. And he told me that in the moment that I heard it. Now, was the, was the company yours at that time? No. No. What he did is when he spoke it to you, okay, you say it came into your mind, however that you were aware of it, that is the communication part that we've talked about before. It's just not words, it's he's communicating something to us. When he communicated it to you, it did not yet, it did not exist at that time. Right. Yet he spoke it to you. And when he spoke it to you, did it come to pass? It did. It came to pass. He spoke it when he spoke to you, it came to pass. So he creates, when he speaks to us, 
He's creating what he is speaking to us at the time he's speaking to, to us. It could be a comprehension of something. I don't have the ability to comprehend that. When he speaks to me, he's creating in me the ability to comprehend the very question I'm asking that if he were to answer, I wouldn't understand it anyway. So he's creating in me the ability to understand the very answer I'm asking. He creates. Every time he speaks, he creates. And he's way out in front. That's the other thing that's amazing. You know, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so what's amazing is I've heard that a million times, Steve. But in the context of what you just said, what is the way? Well, it's yeah. the path. What is the truth, but what is actually I am? Yeah. It is the truth, and it is where life actually exists. Yeah. And if you think about this, this is a future state where heaven and earth are one. This is the kingdom of God. This is essentially what we've ascribed as heaven, is this idea that these things would come together, and that this is actually the passageway, yeah. the way, the truth, and the life, and it's created in you through the spoken word, yeah. and it is created out front. All the things are a reaction behind. Yeah. And that this proactive speaking that creates anew is what well, it calls you out of Egypt, man. You're in bondage. It calls you out. He's constantly calling you out into a new place. When, when this... When you experience this, and it begins by him speaking, then by starting to comprehend a little bit of the concept. But then Jesus never leaves you there. He always brings you into the experience of the very thing that he has spoken. You're describing it here today. See, you're describing our conversation, then what happens right on the heels of our conversation? Yep. You have this epiphany. Well, yep. what is that epiphany about? It's about bringing you into the experience of the very thing we're talking about. So you know that this is not fluff. This is not, you know, this is not pie in the, in the sky stuff. This is how it actually works. This is how heaven and earth are designed to work together under the rule of Jesus. This is what it looks like. And he'll speak it to you. And not only does he speak it to you, I have a friend named Carter is the guy who introduced us, you know, we taught, we went through and, you know, the Lord was working with them for like, you know, what we're now into our seventh year, but um, for five years, we would talk about something and he had the 24 hour rule, you know, within 20, within 24 to 72 hours, I'm going to experience the very thing we just talked about. And he could give you a litany of those experiences that would be, you know, would be from the top of the ceiling down to the bottom of the floor if you listed them one right after the other. Because it's it's real. You just have to get in the game yeah. and be willing to get in the game and say, okay, Jesus, I'm hearing about this. What say you? You know, uh, I'm interested. Okay, Steve, if you're interested, let's do this. All right, um, Lord, yeah. how do we do it? You just follow me. I'll show you how to do it. You just follow me. Okay, I'm in. I don't know what follow means. That's okay. That's okay. You just exercise your choice to follow, and that's what will happen. Wow. <laughs> well, and it makes everything technicolor. Everything becomes in focus. It's like 8K instead of like 360P. Um <laughs> You know, it's amazing. The last thing I'll, I'll say, and we'll have to wrap this up, is... Um, I guess we went over our two hours. Didn't nah, we? two and a half is fine. Hey, it's all right. Those who have ears to hear. Yeah. Um, my wife's planning Easter Sunday, hmm. right? And, you know, you, you talk about this practical example of speaking something this partnership as we join him and what is doing in his work. You know, I think about my wife's desire for hospitality and a gift and, and a concern of caring for people and things. And 
systems and families and institutions and processes and all that stuff. And the practical side of this is she makes me a honey do list, you know, and she speaks it into existence. Yeah. She literally says it doesn't exist. The brisket isn't smoked yet. We don't <laughs> even have it. I got to go after this and go get it with her. But it's like all of these things she imagines in her mind. What it will be like and how many people and how many chairs and how many tables and what the centerpieces are going to look like and all these kind of things. She gets an idea in her mind. She orders stuff early from Amazon and all of these things happen and all these people need to do this and who's bringing this and who's bringing that. And what ends up happening is even in our vision for Sunday's meal, there will be surprises. And it's interesting to think too that Jesus is in it all because we're exercising something unique. Cause my dog doesn't make Sunday Easter Sunday dinner. My dog doesn't change my oil. And it's amazing that when you start actually examining this thing, you realize, you know, we by our very nature are an extension of him. And the question is, I think life is staying connected and that connection is through him speaking. Yeah. And to think that we're in partnership with him as he speaks and creates ahead of us. And so I really think about this, Steve, as, as, as I'm contemplating all of these things, we find ourselves in this interesting position. Why did Brandon be so interested in Texas independence? He lives in Virginia. Why did these people that are in the telegram and people like David Lee and all these people are like, hold on a second, this is really interesting. What is it about the circumstances and the times that we live in, in which things seem to be going to hell in a handbasket and authoritarians on the rise and, you know, this destruction and this desire and deepness in us to say, how do we come together? And then there's hope in different places where we see some light shining. We say, hold on, these immutable contracts on the blockchain. And what is it about these things that say, hold on, if we can get these people out of this control, because this is where their heavy hand is most forcefully you know, squeezing is that we can have this other thing. Well, all of these things are derivative pictures of the one who created it all because it actually is just an extension of him. I even look at AI, Steve, and it's just a derivative. It's amazing to me. What is chat GPT for? Yeah. But an application that exists in the ether through a web browser that you think has knowledge and information that you don't have that you can talk to. Yeah. That's proof, in my opinion, because we in our own desires create as he creates. And it's funny that we would create derivatives and say, no, I'm not going to go to the source of the guy who wrote the story. I'm going to create another tool that I'm going to go to to try to get value from and extract it. And it's it's... It's funny because what did he say? He said, I am. And what's so amazing about that statement is what do we build upon? A one or a zero? Yeah. And he says, I am one. Yeah. I am existence. And it's interesting. Everything. I see this in the coding of how object-oriented programming languages work. You know, it's funny. It's like, yeah, my cat's got a backbone. Oh, yeah, I've got one of those, too. Oh, there's a framework. Oh, you created this thing. And, oh, look at everything we're creating. It kind of mirrors this, but it's only a derivative of the real true creation. And then he gives us the ability to have Sunday dinner and to smoke some meat. And you go, ha, ha, ha. And I love how you responded to Bacon Sandwich. Because what you did is you honored the creation that God made in him. And I love that also. You said that about Peter when, when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You valued, you said, hold on a second. Jesus didn't say, you are Satan. He said, no, no, this one that's in front needs to get behind. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable, man. And we're destroying people rather than saying, hold on a second. No, you are made in the image of God. And I think that's this beauty of the derivative of government. And the derivative of this new world that we can create, you know, by by coming together in community, is that if we understand and work from this basic premise that one, we're not God, 
and two, that people have value in the eyes of the Lord, and that that equality is a part of the framework of his creation, and that justice is at the core. <sighs> so I'm, I'm really excited. What does the future hold? You know, yeah. what, what do things look like? And I just... It's, there for us. it's right there for us. We just got to choose to get to go get it. That it's no more complicated than that. Yeah. We could go all down the road, you know, with the government and all of this stuff. No, it's right there in front of us. We just need to learn who we are and then start exercising who we are with Jesus. And it's going to, it's right there for us. Yeah. He's making it available to us. He's showing us, look at this thing is falling apart right before your very eyes. What are you going to do about it, boys? Yeah. It's there. It's collapsing in front of you. Now, you want to complain about it or you want to do something different? And if you do do something different, how are you going to make it different? Why will it be different if you run it or if the people you elect run it? Why will it be different? Well, I don't know about you. Those are not rhetorical questions. Those are very, very deep questions. They're like the question that Jesus asked to people. And, you know, why do you call aloud to me, Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I say? Wow. Well, you know, that's a two-part question that is <laughs> profound that when you hear it for what it is, it's like, uh, I'm not sure I really know, but I'm, will I'm willing to explore that with you, Lord. Why do I call you Lord? Why do I do that? Say, yeah. I know what the rhetorical answer is, but when you ask it specifically, uh, uh, wow, why do I call out loud to you, Lord? I need to answer that question. Part two, why don't you do what I say? <laughs> oh my goodness. Now you're getting personal. You know, well, yeah, because life is personal. That's how I made it, you know? That's how I made it. You want me to operate it differently than how I made it? Is that what you do with your cars? Do you make a car to drive a car and then try to fly with it? Come on. Yeah. You, I, I make things to accomplish the purpose for which I made them. I made you to be personal with me. Now you can choose not to, because I also made you a choice. You know? So I'm not I'm not gonna intrude on, on your gig. It's not what I'm gonna do but I'm going to invite you into mine, you know, so what do you want to do? Well, Steve, thanks for inviting us into this and giving so much to folks. And, and it's really, it's really been amazing these last four and here we are, you know, Easter coming up, right. We're on good Friday. It's just neat that it's, it's worked out this way and these epiphanies and all this stuff. And I would say this folks, there's not a question that you can ask Jesus that surprises him. Right and so I do love this this approach that Steve is suggesting is it doesn't matter where you are, he's accessible to you. You don't have to go through a middleman. And knowing about hacks and holding T shares are two different things. And it's yeah. the same, same concept here. Steve, thanks for your time today. Happy Easter to you and your family. Thanks for giving so much. And thanks for your willingness to do this. Um and and you've you've like you have served me incredibly and it's helped me understand these things. And I'm just looking forward to what he is creating ahead of us. You bet. Thank all you, right. folks. Happy Easter to all. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Folks, another one. That was episode four. Everyone is my favorite one. Wow, that was really good. That was really good. That was really good. My son came into my, he's, uh, he's going to be 12 here in April, right? In a couple weeks. And he came into the bedroom and of course he, I don't think he wanted to go to sleep. So he was kind of stalling and he was asking me questions about Jesus and about God and, you know, he, very simple terms. And for some reason I, there was a pillow on the bed and I took the pillow and I threw the pillow out into the middle of the bed. And I said, let's say I'm, I'm the father and you're the son. He's like, well, I am your son, dad. I'm like, all right. So you see this pillow we just put out here? We just made that together. And he, and I grabbed something off the table and I put it on the pillow and I said, 
and we made this dude right here. He's like a character in our game. We're like game designers, man. And he loves gaming. I said, look at this, man. We're going to give him like the coolest sword and he's going to have this cool outfit and he's going to be like super handsome, right? Like big muscle guy and really cool. We're going to make him do all these cool things and this adventure of this world that we created, this universe we created that he gets to be in. And dude, he looks like us. He looks like us. He's just better, right? He's bigger, stronger. looks really cool. And I'm like, we get to like control him in this game. We get to send him over here and do these things. But guess what? He looked back at us that created him. And he took out a big pair of scissors or that sword that he had. And he cut the cord. He says, I'm going my own way. And we're like, dude, why'd you do that? Like we had such, I had such plans for you. And so my son and I are sitting in the bed. I'm like, dude, he's gone his own way. And he keeps going and we're checking in on him. We're like, dude, I love that guy. He was so cool. I made him like have all these things and now he's doing his own. He could do so much more if he would just be like connected to me. And so, of course, you know, the, the gaming analogy, we keep looking back into this game and we go, man, I love that guy. Man, he, he's missing out on so much because we're not together. He's decided to go his own way. But I know that I gave him that ability because he's got to fend for himself in this really cool world that we created. And it was really interesting to have that conversation with him for because it was on his you know level. But it was also big for me to say, hold on a second. We've all gone our own way. And it's like, you know, we have one who loves us, who wants to speak to us and guide us. And, and it's like, but you still get to like go through the world and have the sword and have the cool outfit and the big muscles and all that stuff that it is. But it's like for a reason, right? I made this for a reason. But to think that, and I said to him, I said, no, it got out of hand. All these people cut the cord and they're going crazy. All right, son, you got to go into the world. And this is the pillow sitting on the bed. I'm like, we're sending you in. He's like, what? Yeah, we're sending you in. He's like, well, I don't want to go in there. What, what's going to happen to me when I go in there? Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to die at the hands of this dude who's got this sword. It's like, what? We made this dude. Now I got to go let him kill me? Yeah. Yeah. Because why? Why? Because we love him. We made this thing and we need to make it right. All right. Fine. Let's go do that. It's not much different than the story. It's a little bit of a, a weird one. But for a, a young man like my son to see these things and to ask these questions, to understand them, to say, wow, even the simplicity of this is significant, but it's also one in which we go, wow, there is life. Everyone's trying to figure it out. And the people that I see that are at the top of their game, right? Pro baseball player, Steve Staggs, or somebody that's got five Lombardi trophies and they're empty. And people that want the glory or people that want all of these things. We're on a journey and we think that we have the answers in our own, in our own strength and we need help. And I think you get to a certain point where you go, I kind of messed this thing up. And there is, I promise you, life and it is available to you. And Steve is just, you know, helping me understand the very nature of the construct of this game that has been created and it's serious. But it's also an amazing thing because there's work for us to do. And the fact that you know about crypto and the fact that you got it early into this stuff and you understand DeFi, what it is, we're joining him in his work and we're animating these tools for good. And so we're going to be like the bacon sandwich. We're going to be choosing the right things. We're going to animate these things for good. We're going to come together and love each other like David Lee. And in that concern and care for one another... And the listening to the voice of the one who created all, the author, not the derivative. I think we're going to see miracles happen. And heaven and earth will become one. That's the kingdom of God. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt. Steve Staggs is the man. We'll catch you next time. But have an amazing, amazing Easter and reflect upon the amazing work that has been finished. Take care, everybody, and have a great weekend. And don't mess with Texas.